You're listening to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, episode 30, hosted by me, Robert Plotkin. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Lodro Rinsler, an author, a Buddhist meditation teacher, and co-founder of the Mindful Meditation Studio in New York City. Lodro has written several books on Buddhist meditation, as well as a weekly Huffington Post column on the applications of meditation to everyday life. We're extremely pleased to welcome Lodro Rinsler to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. In the interview you're about to hear with Lodro Rinsler, Lodro says that he's grateful that when he grew up before the internet, he had time to develop over the course of many years his own strong and solid foundation in mindfulness practice so that when the internet and smartphones came along, he felt like he had developed the internal tools he needed to stay grounded and focused in the digital world. And that made me realize that although we are all living in that world now, we still have the ability to choose to act as if the internet didn't exist. And if you wonder why you might want to do that, let me give you just one example, and you can get a lot more details in a blog posting I wrote on our site at technologyformindfulness.com called Make Plans as If the Internet Didn't Exist. If you've been frustrated by friends or family members canceling plans with you literally at the last minute by text message, or if, now please be honest and admit it, if you've ever done that to people, Here's my quick suggestion. When you're going to meet someone, set a limit, maybe the hour before that meeting. Act as if you don't have access to the internet, that you don't have access to a GPS, that you don't have the ability to look up directions, and that the person you're about to meet with is unreachable in that hour or whatever other time before the meeting. And what this will mean is you won't have the ability to cancel with them. You'll have to follow through on meeting with them at the time you agreed on. It also, I found, causes me to plan further in advance for the directions I'm going to follow to get to where I'm going. It means that before I leave, I already know how I'm going to get there, how long it's going to take because I've committed to not accessing a GPS or Google for searching for a place in that time period before I leave. I'm acting in that window of time before the meeting as if the internet didn't exist. I suggest trying it out. Maybe first set the time limit as a short one and then gradually expand it to challenge yourself and just see what kinds of positive benefits it has on you and all the people in your life who you meet with. Hope you find that helpful, and I hope that you enjoy the upcoming interview with Lodro Rinsler. Hi, Lodro, and welcome to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Thanks for having me. It's really great to have you here. I know that you have been meditating and a uh, practitioner of mindfulness from a very young age. Uh, uh, I wonder what you can say, and I know you've also written uh, and teach specifically about mindfulness and meditation as it applies to people's work and careers, uh, you know, some very practical ways to apply uh, to apply mindfulness in addition to practicing it for its own sake. You know, I wonder if you could get started by uh, talking a little bit about, you know, uh, for the listeners of our podcast, uh, which is about technology and mindfulness, if you could talk a little bit about in your own experience, perhaps what impact uh, technology has had on your attention and focus, and if there's any ways in which it's affected your mindfulness practice or you've, or that you've brought your mindfulness practice to your relationship with technology in ways that you found, you know, can be beneficial to other people. 
Sure. I mean, this is actually a funny conversation just in that I, I do tend to reveal my age a little bit in that I started practicing meditation before there was sort of a prevalence of um, handheld technology. I think the only handheld technology I had growing up with was a Game Boy. Uh, so I started practicing when I was about six years old. My parents were Buddhists. I was raised um, in New York City as a uh, Shambhala Buddhist. And I, they walked in on me meditating when I was six. And so I said, you know, over dinner that night, they said, said what, what were you doing when you were sitting there? I said, um, you know, I was meditating. They said, what does that mean? And I said, well, I was just looking at my breathing. And they said, what happened when you got distracted? And I said, then I would see that. And then I would come back to my breathing. And they were like, well, he's got it. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know, had, had they taught you that specifically? Or do you think you picked it up from, from them? Or how did, how did you come to that at such a young age? I think it was environmental. I think, you know, they took me around to the Buddhist stuff that they were doing and I, I just sort of picked it up and it is, you know, sort of something that even a six year old can learn. Um, and, you know, I went on later on in life to then, you know, particularly my teenage years have a relationship to like what AOL instant messenger and, you know, like really basic internet. And then before it became really prevalent when I was in, you know, late high school, early college, uh, I went off to the monastery, uh, Gempo Abbey in Nova Scotia and shaved my head and took the robes and the whole nine yards and spent a summer there. And so I have to say my relationship with mindfulness meditation, which is, you know, watching the breath and, um, this sense of technology sort of went hand in hand that they sort of came up together so that by the time that you know, I did have a smartphone and things like that. I was already teaching meditation and I was already sort of in it, even though I have to say, just to sort of showcase how quickly technology has moved and how quickly it's taken over our lives, you know, I'm 35. So it's not like this is a very long trajectory. It's just that, you know, by the time I was in college, you know, when I was graduating, I had a cell phone and I could look things up on Google. But before that, you know, I was really, I'd been practicing already. So it felt like those two things were very hand in hand. Technology, how does it affect my mindfulness or my meditation? I would say, unfortunately, it's primarily a distraction. Um, I would say the main struggle I would have in a given day would be right when I wake up because my alarm clock, I, I had a traditional alarm clock, it died, and I didn't replace it. So I have my phone on airplane mode ringing the alarm. And that means that the first thing I do in the morning before I even practice is I reach for the phone, even just to turn it off. And then I might have a moment of practice before I actually then, you know, take it off of airplane mode. But I think that at that moment, there's like a conscious choice of like, gosh, are you doing that? Or are you going to get out of bed, drink your coffee and turn that on later? Mm -hmm. So it's a subtle thing where I almost, I find myself opting in to distraction pretty early on. And it's something that I have to admit I struggle with, um, but I've gotten a lot better with over time. Mm. Yeah, I mean, one thing uh, I've done is take gone back to to an old fashioned alarm clock for that reason. But I I appreciate the having the opportunity to practice even you know at that moment turning the phone off uh, because it's capable of doing so many things. Uh, it does tend to become somewhat omnipresent in our lives, you know, even even on or near near the bed. I mean, but you mentioned that you've had the opportunity, maybe we'd say the benefit of having developed uh, a mindfulness practice long before technology became so present in your life. I wonder you know, what you could say about that if you've noticed uh, differences uh, that people who you've encountered who let's say didn't develop a mindfulness practice before the, let's say the last 10 years of technology and maybe different challenges they have than, than you've had in trying to uh, develop their own mindfulness now? Yeah. I mean, I have to say, I, I feel like by the time that people wash on the shores of where I teach, um, they've already realized that they, their iPhone or their laptop isn't necessarily the source of happiness. Uh, and by that, I mean that, you know, there's so many ways that we look for happiness in external factors, whether we are on our phone on Tinder or whether we are 
on our laptop, online shopping, when we should be sort of paying attention to a meeting. You know, there's lots of ways that we rely on technology to be the tool of distraction. This means not that technology is a bad thing, but that it is is a tool like any other tool, right? Like a hammer is a tool. It could be used to put a nail on a wall and have the most beautiful piece of art, or it could be used to bash someone's head in. And mm-hmm. I think people are looking at the tool of technology and they're saying, I don't necessarily think that this is the thing that's going to make me happy. Um, their relationship to it is, it's often a little bit toxic. So we have um, three meditation studios here in New York. They're called Mindful. We also have a corporate meditation program, a nonprofit arm that brings meditation into the school system. And even, and believe it or not, we employ technology ourselves for a video channel so that people can watch um, our meditation teachers in their own home called Mindful Video. And the thing when people come to the studio in particular is that there is a no technology sign. So they kick off their shoes and we say, would you like a tour? And then they hit this point and they say, oh, um, I see the signage. I'm not supposed to be on my phone. So half of our square footage is designed as community space. And while it's a lovely meditation center, and even as I'm sitting here, there's a class going on on the other side of this wall that, uh, you know, it's one o'clock in the afternoon and there's classes happening at all three studios. But people seem to also love, in addition to the meditation, a space that is technology free, quiet, comfortable, and they actually start to meet people. We've had people fall in love because they weren't all staring at their phone. We've had people develop friendships and you know find work connections because you're in a space that all of a sudden says, no, no, actually, we're not going to be on technology here. We're going to be, uh, you can read a book, you can have a cup of tea, you could talk to people. Mm. And there's no explicit, like, you have to talk to people, but just by the sheer, sheer um, nature of their, it being a tech-free zone, it uh, en- encourages people to actually raise their gaze and connect with others. That's great. I mean, it, it is unusual uh, to have a space where you're teaching formal meditation, but it sounds like you also have part of the space being available for people to just interact with each other outside of the classes or guided meditations. Yeah, that's 100% correct. Uh, and where, where did that idea come from to make it part, as you said, community center, uh, in addition to uh, a place where you're teaching meditation classes? Yeah, I mean, my um, upbringing and even my early career life was all spent in Buddhist nonprofits and um, nothing against any particular organization I've studied in or worked with, but a lot of times um, people show up and they're feeling a little nervous. They're not sure what they're getting into. And there isn't a lot of friendliness. People sort of saying, like, let me show you around. Let me make you feel at home. We're hosting you. Like, not a lot of sort of, in my mind, Southern hospitality. Um, and we just knew that if we were going to open these meditation studios, these studios that operate essentially like a yoga studio model, we have, we have half hour, 45 minute classes, morning, evening, in the middle of the day, um, that if people were going to drop in, they were going to sort of check it out. You know, so we tried to make it as accessible as possible. But part of that was saying, oh, we also have to make it as kind as possible. Part of making it as kind as possible is really making sure that when people walk in the door and they're greeted properly, that they're shown around, that they understand um, what's available to them, that they, we give them free tea. You know, we have books for them to read. We might even say, oh, you know, you're from this area neighborhood, so and so's from this neighborhood, and just make a brief introduction so that people do feel like there's a space for them that is safe and quiet. Um, particularly in a very politically charged time, a time where great injustices are happening, um, where racism has made its ugly face very well known. The fact that there is something that's considered a safe space we thought was incredibly important. Um, So alongside, yes, traditional meditation teachings, I think that level of inclusion and uh, sensitivity to sort of the nervousness that people might have around something like meditation is really something that we want to address head on. That's really great. You know, you mentioned yoga studio, but my experience, any space these days that's directed primarily at people coming in to engage in a particular activity, you know, uh, often uh, is structured such that people come in and there's just room for them to do that activity. Uh, Take the yoga class or the meditation class or whatever else it happens to be. And uh, there may not either be physical space for them to do anything else there or uh, 
anything else structured, like you said, people being greeted in a particular way that would encourage or facilitate them interacting with each other in any way outside of whatever class or activity they're engaged in. Yeah, that's 100% right. Yeah. And, you know, I found in my own experience often, I'm, I'm wanting to uh, get to know people or form relationships that go beyond the activity. And of course, we can do that on our own outside. But what, what a gift it is for you to provide something as part of the space itself that facilitates that, those other kinds of rela- deeper relationships people can form. Yeah, I think that there's something really important to just the human aspect, right? Because my understanding of meditation is that it exposes all of our humanity. And in order to do that, we actually sort of need a community that's going to support us. And, a, you know, this is sort of going back to the core tenets of, um, of Buddhism, that there's things that we could take refuge in when all of samsara, the cycle of suffering, has sort of thrown us for a loop, meaning that there is the Buddha as an example of someone who's able to wake up in a really profound way, the teachings he provided so that we could actually follow in that example. But then there's this community. And everyone always says, like, oh, the community, who needs it? And, you know, particularly as we picked our teachers, we thought there's a lot of really wonderful teachers out there that um, there's a little bit of, like, they're up on the mountain and we're down here. Maybe there's a sense of, like, they're not as accessible to us. And we wanted our teachers to be extremely accessible. So we chose people who are really kind and they serve, you know, in the Tibetan Buddhist model, we have sort of these three terms. One's an instructor where someone just sort of gives you teachings and that's wonderful. You take a five week class, that's an instructor. Um, and the flip side of that, the far end would be the guru, this person who is, you know, the person who introduces you to the nature of your mind and they um, will give you teachings maybe once a year or a little bit more frequently, but there's some sense of like, you're all in, that's your person, that's your root teacher for the rest of your life. And in between those two is spiritual friend. And I I think what we've done here is we've developed 35 people on faculty who are spiritual friends, meaning that they are going to do a little bit more than just teach you and kick you at the door. They're going to be there for you. They're going to make recommendations on readings and on retreats and other ways that you could go deeper with your practice. And also, you know, they're going to sort of hang out and, hold space for you to go through what you need to go through. Um, so it's a little bit different than an instructor, but it's not the person way out there that's like, you know, you're sort of like, that's not unattainable state. They're, they're human. There's something very human about them. So I think if these practices really are to reveal the core of our humanity, which in my tradition we would say is basically good, then I, I think we've got a really unique model that we've been working on. And that actually gave birth to some of the writing I've been doing. As you mentioned, I've done about six books now. The Buddha walks into a bar, the Buddha walks into the office, walk like a Buddha, sit like a Buddha, how to love yourself and sometimes other people, love hurts. So I've been on this love theme and it actually sort of continued on. Um, Coming out of Mindful, founding these studios, uh, the new book is called How to Be Decent, A Mindful Guide to a Mm -hmm. Stuff World. And it's the idea of like, we actually need to connect with our own human decency if we're going to actually really change the state of the world overall. And meditation can help us with that. Tell us, what do, you, what do you mean by decency? But perhaps more importantly, what motivated you? What felt so important about this that you decided to write a book about it? Yeah, I mean, we live, as I mentioned before, in this very charged time where I think a lot of us would say that it, there's the reigning uh, nature of things right now is indecency. It's a lot of aggression, a lot of speed. So when I talk about decency, I'm, returning, I'm talking about a return to our basic state, our sense of goodness, our sense of wholeness, completeness as is, and that we could actually move from the first section is really like how do we relate to our own sense of decency through the nitty gritty aspects of our life, the way the clothes we pick out, the way we build our home, the way we manage our finances up until the second section, which is like, then how do we not being associated with our own sense of decency, our own sense of goodness? having cultivated it through meditation, how do we take that out and start to treat everyone with that same sense of decency? In my tradition, again, we would say that we're basically good, whole, complete as is, and then we could actually start to treat other people from that lens of saying, actually, you're basically good, even if you're acting confused right now, even if you are acting indecent or unkind from your own confusion, there's some core belief behind these teachings that says, that's not inherently who you are. You're just confused. And some real sense of like, we don't give up on people as a result of that. 
that we don't give up on anyone because at their core, they're good. So mm. there's, uh, as we get into the second section, we talk about going on a date, building a friendship, uh, difficult work colleagues, you know, ways that we could actually start to approach people in our life, sometimes when we're in uncomfortable positions, and learn to share from a place of our own wholeness and completeness and connect with others through that lens that they possess the same goodness as well. And then the third section, and I'll shut up after this, is that society. Because as I mentioned, we live in a time where society is considered really aggressive and speedy. And yet society isn't some big thing out there. It's not like some, like right beyond the walls of our homes, there's a society. It's society exists everywhere. Like our home life, our family is a society, is made up of certain people and certain rules and certain norms and things like that. And that's a society. My teacher is often fond of saying that society could be two people sitting down and having tea. You and I, we're, we're recording a podcast. We're, we're in a society right now. We're here. We're talking about things that we find meaningful. We're using our speech in a certain way. And this also then, of course, as you release this, has a ripple effect on others. If we sat here slandering celebrities and talking negatively about people we know in common, all these sorts of things, that sounds a very different thing out to the world. So the ways that we form society, whether it's two people or a family or a workplace or a neighborhood, it actually does have a ripple effect that whoever we encounter from either place of decency and kindness or a place of speediness and aggression, that then ripples out into their life and to the people that they have contact with and has a massive effect on society overall. So even though meditation, people often think about it as some sort of small thing, like I'm just going to you know, deal with my personal stress. Over time, people realize like this actually is much bigger. It's affecting every aspect of my life and my relationships. And then those relationships are affecting other relationships and it gets quite big. So it's how can we actually start to do that from a place of decency? I really found that very helpful. I've, I've sometimes heard people say that meditating you know, individually can change the world. But, you know, sometimes for me, the explanation is lacking in, in how, uh, you know, and I, I like, you know, you're, you're talking about how meditation, I think, impacts our actions, not just our thought, in particular, how we interact with other people. Uh, and that that's part of the how, you know, how we interact, even just, as you said, with one other person uh, ha has an impact on that person, on both of us. And, you know, that there is a real direct connection between how we work on and, and change ourselves and our speech and our behavior and the people around us, even if the way we start is by uh, practicing alone just with our own self. Yeah. And I, I do think we have to start with ourself. It's not like we can skip to saving the world without actually looking at everything from the ways that we might beat ourselves up and be unkind to ourselves, all the way up to ways that we might have formed unconscious bias in terms of how we relate to people who do not look or act like us. There's a lot for us to sort of plumb in terms of our own relationship to ourself through meditation before we then take it to the streets, as it were, and start trying to help others. But the flip side of that, as you mentioned, is that people often end up um, not getting to the streets because they get very lost in thinking, I've got to have my whole act figured out. I've got to get fully enlightened and then I'll help people. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sort of those two have to go hand in hand. Yeah, uh, we're, we're, each of us is a, always a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it may, it reminds me of, I know I've heard um, Jack Cornfield and some other uh, of the uh, Westerners who first brought back uh, Buddhist practices saying that uh, their teachers found uh, that they were surprised to see that in, let's say, just in the U.S., how much this belief that we're we're individually flawed or there's something wrong with us, uh, was that self-loathing <laughs> was so common. It wasn't something that they had previously had to deal with so prominently, uh, in their students where they came from. And I think the, the, uh, Americans who came back here ended up really modifying a lot of how they taught mindfulness here because that, that feeling is so prevalent and so dominant amongst so many people. I don't know if you can speak to that at all. 
Yeah, I'm happy to. I mean, I do think that it's a major issue. Um, back when I started on the sort of love topic, and I do think How to Be Decent, uh, the Mindful Guide to Messed Up World, is sort of an extension of my love exploration because it's sort of like it's starting to deal with how we look at it as a society. But going back, it went to it starts with ourself, how to love yourself, and then sometimes other people. And I love the way that they sort of made the how to love yourself a big font and the rest of it very small because there's sort of that balance of, okay, like we've got to start with ourselves because way too many of us, um, the idea of actually taking some time and space to just relax and be with the present moment as is, is sometimes deeply intimidating because people are scared what they're going to find. Um, that they have a waterfall of thoughts, that they keep beating themselves up because they're not good at meditation after doing it once or three times, um, is, is quite prevalent. And I think a lot of the learning curve for if this meditation movement, if it's going to continue to be a thing, is the education around um, the fact that it takes time to actually see the benefits. And part of that sort of time is that we need to get over the sort of judging ourselves during the practice itself. So I actually think that, and this is my own theory, it does not come from anywhere else, um, that meditation has become very well known for making us more present. You know, a lot of the research around it says, you know, normalizes our sleep patterns and makes us more productive and efficient. And a lot of it's because we're not as held by stress, we're more able to just be present. But if for anyone to it who's ever meditated before, you know you sit down and you think everyone else in the room is present, but you're the one that's freaking out and having a thought every three seconds and having a hard time taming the mind and all of those things. I actually think 50% of this is not it's just being present. The other 50% is um, actually being kind to ourselves. Like in that moment when we have the awareness to see that we have drifted off in thought, what do we do? Do we beat ourselves up? Do we use this as yet another tool to cause self-aggression? To so you're bad at this, you're failing at this, everyone else is getting this right but you? Or do we use that moment that we've drifted off as an opportunity where we say, oh, it's not a big deal. I can actually relax. I can just come back to the breath. If we do the latter, we're actually rewiring the mind for kindness, for gentleness. And the more we deepen that, well, kindness and I'll even say love for ourselves, the more we have to offer to other human beings. We often think we should just go out and be compassionate. But if we haven't actually taken the time to develop love for ourselves, then we don't know what we're doing. It's similar to if you made a new friend, you go to a barbecue this summer, you meet someone, you chat them up. You don't immediately turn to that friend and say, listen, I need you to help me move and I want you to, um, you know, come to my friend's party where it's going to be really awkward for you. And like, we don't start making demands of them. We, we just get to know them a little bit. We say, what's going on with you? Who are you? We become gently curious about them. Then maybe time passes. We spend more and more time with our friend. And the more time we spend with this person, the more we're like, I like this person. They're my friend. And then over time, we look over our shoulder. And we don't know when it happened, but we actually love our friend. You know, maybe it's been years, but we feel real love for this person. So the same thing can be said for meditation in our own mind, right? We're sitting here and first we're like, God, this is really overwhelming. We don't just start making demands for our mind. Only be with the breath. Anytime you're not with the breath, I don't like you, right? We're just like, okay, I'm going to become gently and curious about my experience. Keep going. And then maybe over weeks, over months, we're like, oh, I'm more familiar with who I am. I've gotten to know myself better. And as a result, I might actually might feel a sense of kinship or friendship with myself and then maybe further time passes but this is exactly how we get to the point we're like oh i love myself i've actually learned mm. to love myself in fact we do a little 30-day challenge thing here over at mindful you come 30 days in a row you get your next month membership half off this is part of our incentivizing people to actually get launch practice and i remember the first time we did it years ago someone raised their hand and said it was their 30th day and they're asked you know, what, what do you, you tell me, why should anyone do this practice after 30 days? What's the benefit? And that person said, you know, I don't know if I'm X percent more present or if I sleep better, but I can say at the age of 55, this is the first time in my life I have actually learned the tools to love myself. Mm. 30 days of meditation. I feel like that is life changing. 
he'd got nothing else from his practice and never did again. I mean, he had to, you know, <laughs> well, he's, I see him every Thursday, you know, he's still practicing very regularly, but, um, you know, I, I feel like that's more than enough. That's a really beautiful benefit that no one's talking about around these practices. Yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts in general about the, the extent to which mindfulness has become popular on the one hand, uh, and spread so far and wide. Uh, and on the other hand, it seems like uh, there are ways in which some of the, you know, deeper aspects of mindfulness are not being spread as far, like the things you just talked about. Uh, it seemed, I, I seem to hear a lot about mindfulness as if it starts and ends with paying attention to your breath. <laughs> right. You know, I, I mean, I know that's, that's an important part of it, but I think as it becomes more popularized or becomes more mainstream, uh, it seems that some of the more subtle nuances that come from perhaps, uh, interacting with more experienced guides or just practicing it longer and deeper yourself that are getting lost. Yeah. Um, so there's two aspects of this. One would be that, I mean, you're right. Like there's the old argument of what if we just taught mindfulness to assassins and just make them better assassins. <laughs> right. Right. Um, I have never met such a person. Maybe they exist out there. But I feel like if you're actually doing practices rooted in a tradition and you start to get some of the view, then you start to understand um, a little bit more about like why you should do that. <laughs> so I feel like the first thing I want to say is that ethics should not be divorced from practice. I think that's important that we still have it. You know, here at Mindful, we do this really interesting thing where we don't use a lot of jargon. We don't give long talks, but we always give five, seven minutes of view of what is this practice? Where did it come from? Why do we do it? So that people have context. And, you know, we encourage people to sort of explore deeper. Even if you only come for a half hour, at least you know where shamatha comes from, right? You, which is commonly translated as calm abiding or peaceful abiding meditation. But at least you know that, like, where this stems from, the tradition is, and what the benefits are. Um, it doesn't take a lot of time for us to do that. You know, I think people feel like they have to do two hour long song and dance every time they introduce meditation. That's not true. Um, but on the flip side of this, in addition to saying, well, maybe there should be the introduction of ethics as opposed to allowing the practices just to be the practices. I do believe that the practices have tremendous power. So I've never seen anyone, you know, under my guidance here at Mindful, where they come in and they do, you know, a couple of weeks of meditation. And they don't walk out with just like, oh, I'm, I'm more present. They walk out with like, oh, I'm kinder. I'm actually more compassionate. And here's why. I think if you're actually doing the practices, what you're doing there is you're sitting there and saying, I'm suffering. <laughs> There's a lot of anger coming up and I'm seeing it. And okay, I get it. Uh, and then we come back to the breath or we work with it in other meditative traditions. Um, but then we go into the world and we see our, that jerk at work and they're struggling and they're angry. And our, all of a sudden our heart goes, oh, wait, I know what that's like. Gosh, that's, that's really hard. And instead of just saying like, they're an asshole, excuse my language, we're like, oh, I understand how painful it is to be trapped by anger. And our heart might just start to open to them quite naturally because we've been meditating because we're so familiar with that form of suffering. So I think mindfulness practice in particular does give birth to compassion quite naturally. Yeah. I wonder if you could, you've mentioned, you know, someone at work and I know one of your books was The Buddha Walks Into the Office. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit specifically uh, about the mindfulness in the workplace, uh, particularly in relation to how, how much technology is dominant in the, in the workplace these days and, and places demands on us. Um, you know, I know one common concern or complaint from people is they don't have time because either work takes up so much of their time or or just because it, it it's so nonstop. You know, can you talk a little bit to the place of, of mindfulness and meditation in the modern workplace? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so I think it was my, my third book was The Buddha Walks Into the Office. And it is very much both how do we allow meditation to awaken some sense of intuitive awareness so we can start to discern the best vocation for us and how to actually employ 
um, ourselves at our work in a way that feels meaningful and based in intentions and qualities that we want to cultivate in our day-to-day life. But there is an element here of just like, how do we bring mindfulness into the office? And, you know, here at our studios, we've actually, through no outreach of our own, just incoming requests, we're in over a hundred companies around New York City area. Um, and it's been really interesting to not only myself, but all of the other teachers go out and offer these practices in conference rooms, you know, small rooms, offices, auditoriums, you name it. Um, we even actually at this point have built out a handful of like little mindful areas um, in people's offices. Um, so it's really, it's first of all, a shocking time that there are, there's such a demand for people who want to bring this into their workplace. I remember back when I was on tour for that book, it was 2000 and I want to say 13 or 14. And um, I was at a large um, crowdfunding website office and they um, had me lead meditation at the end of the workday and half the office turned out. We're talking 100 employees maybe. And they were not equipped for that. It was just sort of this open floor plan, very like San Francisco tech space sort of thing. <laughs> but they all sort of crammed in. And at the end, someone said, do you think we could me- we could do meditation here at work? And I said, I'm sure you could. You know, look at how many people are here. Half the office is here. It's clearly well supported. It's not going to be considered weird. Um, if you want, you could even, you know, set yourself up in a conference room and every day at noon or every Tuesday at noon, you know, just invite colleagues and see who shows up. And I still recommend that sort of thing, by the way. Um, and someone raised their hand and they said, you know, I bet we could even use the Zen room for that. And I said, you have a Zen room? And they said, yeah. yeah. I said, what are people using? And they go private phone calls, you know, uh, breastfeeding the mother's nurse there. And I was like, you have a Zen room and you're asking me if you can meditate here. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> uh, it's really funny to me that people still feel like, you know, gosh, I don't want to be the weirdo at work because everyone's the weirdo at work that wants to do this is my experience. Um, you might find outliers that are like, gosh, that's weird. But I, I don't think, um, I think it's just much more accepted than it used to be. So I do believe that, you know, starting a small group of um, people who meditate together at work at a certain time every week or every day is really wonderful. I also think that um, even just as an individual, one thing that I recommend doing is setting a timer. It Maybe it is on your phone but some sort of ding that goes off about every 30 minutes or every 60 minutes, whatever you prefer. And at that moment, you would actually stop and do a short body scan, connect to the breath, you know, rest for a minute, just feeling the body breathing when you notice that you've drifted off, coming back to that sensation. And then at the end of that minute, it doesn't have to be exact, but approximately, you open up your laptop again and you go back to work and you reset the timer so that you keep sort of taking these mindful breaks, these little moments where you're like, oh, wait, I don't have to continue at the same speed and momentum as I normally do. I can actually start to take moments of relaxation throughout the day and sort of infuse my workday with mindfulness. Yeah, I think part of the complaint that many people have very justifiably is that uh, their work days have gotten longer. There's been more and more demands placed on them over time. Uh, and it can feel like there's just no time throughout the day uh, to pause to the extent that part of what mindfulness is about is, is pausing. Uh, you know, and your suggestion is find whatever time there is, even if it's 30 seconds or a minute. And most people can find that a few times during the day, no matter how busy it might be. Yeah, absolutely. I I really do believe it. I also, by the way, I'm a firm believer, not to push back on anyone who's listening, but I'm a firm believer that we all have 10 minutes a day. You know, I have a meditation student and they're a nurse practitioner. They've got two kids. They wake up before everyone in the morning. Their kids have what can only be identified as mommy sense, where it's like they just know when their mother's up and they rouse themselves and run into the room while she's meditating and burst through the door, fight over who gets to sit on what knee. And she still meditates 10 minutes a day. Yeah. You know, like if she can do 10 minutes a day, I feel like so many of us can do 10 minutes a day. Um, We just often get distracted by saying, oh, well, it's not going to be the perfect 10 minutes. 
right? Because I'm going to be on the subway or it's not going to be the perfect 10 minutes because my kids are going to be rattling around in the other room or whatever. Um, but I really do believe that if we really prioritize this 10 minutes, we can do. I really do believe that. Yeah. And I think for people who haven't meditated or maybe even for people who have, you know, that, that idea that it may not be perfect uh, as something that, that holds people back. I mean, you know, from doing the practice itself, uh, you know, that, you know, it may, I don't know that I've ever had a perfect 10 minutes of meditating, whatever perfect might mean. Uh, it, it is what it is at any time. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, and there's some element of like, your practice is okay as it is. And my favorite word to go back to a previous conversation was um, the term word gong is a word for meditation, but it also can be translated as become familiar with or familiarization. So it's just 10 minutes of getting to know ourselves. And there's no wrong way to do that, right? Like we're with the breath, we get distracted. Oh, interesting that that's what's distracting me today. And then we come back, you know, like it just happens over and over again, but still worthwhile every time. Right. Whatever it is that we see that, that insight or, or knowledge is helpful. And, um, you know, I, I, I really appreciate what you said earlier. I think it's come up a f in a few different ways, uh, while you've been speaking this very common feeling that somehow, uh, our experience is different. We're not as good at meditating or we won't get as much out of it or there's other people are not experiencing the same thing as us. Uh, you know, I've appreciated um, meditation teachers I've had who I look to as being somehow really accomplished who relate their current experience with meditation as often involving being distracted or their time off the cushion, so to speak, getting distracted or angry or annoyed at people. Uh, and it's helpful for me to see, oh, there's someone else, even someone who's a quote, you know, accomplished meditator who still has these experiences. It helps normalize it. Um, you know, I, I find that helpful. It sounds like that's part of what you're doing through the community too, that you're creating. Yeah, that's hundred percent right. That there's some sense of community support that we're all in this together. Yeah, that other people are, are having the same experience. And you're right, when you're sitting in a, in a room meditating silently with other people, uh, although there may be, and I found, I've certainly felt this, a feeling of support, even though it's not coming from anyone else's words, because we're all sitting there silently. But as you said, sometimes there, I can have a feeling that <laughs> other people are doing it better <laughs> than I am. Yeah. What would what would you say to people, uh, you know, who who haven't meditated before, who've heard about it, who are curious, uh, maybe have heard about some of the the practical benefits of it for stress relief or for focus, or you know, what would you say to them, either about uh, how maybe about how they could get started, either formally by coming to. Uh, uh, some guided meditation classes at your center or even just on their own? How would you encourage people to get started and any any words of encouragement that you could give them? Sure. Um, I mean, the first thing is uh, meditation takes time. And I think that's the thing that like in all of these magazine articles and things like that, we see all the benefits. Very rarely do we see... Um, that element of like, but by the way, it's going to take time to see those benefits. Like in the same way that I wouldn't expect to step outside right now and run a marathon. Like I couldn't do it. That's not what my body's able to do. But if I trained regularly, I definitely could do that over time. Right. So same thing of like, you know, I want to immediately feel like I have a completely different relationship to my stress. Well, you can get there, but it's going to take time. So I think giving yourself the space and patience to really launch a practice properly is important. That said, I'll, I'll just sort of give something sort of um, a little bit more bite-sized so that people understand how to launch such a thing. And the first thing I would say would be that consistent amount of time, just 10 minutes a day. And trying to make that consistent amount of time be in a consistent time of day, meaning like your morning routine, your afternoon routine, your evening routine, something. Like it could be your coming home from work routine. You put down your bag, you, you know, take the dog for a walk, and you meditate. 
and then you go into whatever else you need to do. But like just sort of building it into existing routines is really helpful. Otherwise, we keep mentally pushing it off and saying, well, I'm going to do it later. I'll do it later. I'll do it later. And then it becomes the next day. The other aspects I'll say is um, having a space ready for you so that you don't end up having to rearrange your home for 15 minutes to meditate for 10. Right? It's mm. something that's just there. And as you said, you know, of course, people, particularly if they're in New York, they could come to Mindful and drop into the space here and all of that. That's wonderful. It's ready for you. But having a cushion at home or having a candle or an incense burner or a statue or an image of someone you admire, something that says that's the corner or nook that I go to meditate is really helpful. And you're just magnetized there. And the last thing I'll say is that it's really helpful um, to do it consistently. And so if I were to train for a marathon, if I only ran once a week, I would never get there. But if I did a little bit every day, then lo and behold, my body would just sort of naturally acclimate to the point that I can do more and more and more. And then I would be able to actually run such a thing. So same thing here. It's sort of, it's a cumulative thing where if we meditate for say a couple of weeks in a row, all of a sudden it becomes natural to us. It feels as wonderful and regular as brushing our teeth or flossing or whatever it might be. You know, these sort of positive habits become fully ingrained in the brain after a number of weeks, three, four weeks usually. So having the sense of consistent pacing at that point is that gentleman who I mentioned earlier, who learned to love himself after 30 days is like, that's the moment where we're like, Oh, I see the benefits for myself. And that's where it gets really juicy because then we know why we're meditating. It's not just like someone told us it's a good thing for us to do and we believe them. It's like, I understand because it's in my bones. Once it's Mm -hmm. in your bones, it's like, you only want to go further. (laughs) That's great. Really, really great note uh, to end on. Uh, Thanks so much, Lodro, for being on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. I really, really enjoyed speaking with you today. Um, My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us for this Technology for Mindfulness podcast with me, Robert Plotkin. And today's guest, Lodro Rinsler, a Buddhist meditation teacher and co-founder of the Mindful Meditation Studio in New York City, which brings together meditation teachers from a wide variety of traditions to make both meditation and social connection available to people throughout New York City and beyond through in-person and online sessions. You can find out more about Lodro and the Mindful Meditation Studio at mndflmeditation.com. If you liked today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and share the episode with your friends. Those and all other links are in the show notes. And check out our blog at technologyformindfulness.com for information and tips about science, technology, and mindfulness. I'm Robert Plotkin, and I'll join you next time on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast with Miko Whitlock, also known as the Mindful Techie when we'll talk about how to tackle the challenges posed by technology to our productivity and well-being in both our work and personal lives.